On this episode of Another Zelda Podcast, David and Kate talk about the Minish Cap. Hello and welcome to another Zelda podcast. I am David Geisler, uh, one of the hosts for the show, and I am today joined yet again by my co-host, Kate Fisher. My co-host, Kate Fisher. That's kind of me, yes. Hello! <laughs> Kate, how are you? I'm doing very well. How it's are been, you? It has been, I think, about a month since we've seen each other, actually. Yeah, it's we, a yeah. beauteous day today. It is a gorgeous day. It's almost the fall, but we're getting uh, treated with some great weather. Yes, indeed. So today, I am... Shaking in my little Minish Cap boots. It's a weird way to say it. I'm so excited. We're going to be reviewing, or at least talking about Minish Cap today. Yeah. Cutting right to the chase. Actually, I have a yeah. little bit of listener feedback. But um, um, first, Minish Cap, I can't wait. I, this one has been, we've been talking about this one for a while. Mm-hmm. I think that we're both going to have a lot of things to say based yeah. on like some previous off mic conversations. It was a fun time. I liked it. So honestly, spoiler alert, yeah, I, I know. liked it. <laughs> For me it was as well and I can't wait to talk about it because I didn't expect it at first. Yeah. So uh, let's do some listener feedback first. I have two tweets and a, a Discord that I'd like to talk about. So um people you pe- people listen, you can always tweet us. <laughs> At another Zelda pod. Do what we say. Or go to Instagram at another Zelda podcast. We also have a Facebook page, which you can find on another Zelda podcast. And um, we just recently, um, a couple weeks ago, we kind of revamped our Patreon. And a part of that was bringing in a Discord account. So now we have an ongoing Discord, Mm -hmm. which is actually not exclusive to our patrons. We just give them easy access to it. Mm-hmm. So um, if people are inclined to find our Discord, we have an, a link to it in our episode notes. And I have a comment specifically about Minish Cap there. In fact, why don't we start with Discord? Okay, that sounds good. Great. Chris OTW, um, I, I, we have a little channel going on Discord for every single game and all the different topics that we talk about. So that as a place for people that continue to have conversations, we have Mr. Alex Sheehan actually working as one of our moderators on Discord. He's a big fan of the Zelda games and maybe it'd be fun to have him be a guest on the show yeah. sometime. But anyway, um, so Chris OTW uh, said, I was pleasantly surprised when I asked How do you feel about Minish Cap? We're going Mm -hmm. to talk about it. He said, I was pleasantly surprised by the gameplay. The puzzles were not overly complicated. The music top notch as usual. And I was impressed by the visual build of the land of Hyrule. The fetching in order to progress became a little cumbersome at times, but it totally, but in totality, it really, I really enjoyed the experience. I didn't feel as immersed in Minish Cap as some others, maybe due to the lack of storytelling or just the overall effect of the point of view. I don't think that a year from now I'll have a thought that creates the nostalgia to go back to Minish Cap the way Twilight Princess does. So um, how do you feel about that, Kate? Uh, That's creepy because I agree with 100% of what he said. And I mean, that's... Not verbatim, but that is pretty much uh, How you in feel. my notes. Yeah, that's wonderful. As well. All well, of those points. I all of those with. points. Yeah. We weird. will we'll dive into that deeper yeah. uh, once we really get rolling here. I want to talk about some tweets that we got on Twitter real quick. This one was adorable. I fell in love with it, so I really wanted to make sure that we spoke about it in this episode. Um, at C Spielman, C S P I E L M A N, tweeted us another Zelda pod. Kids made me listen to several episodes during a road trip. Thanks for the unexpected, pleasant entertainment for us all. It's so cute. Isn't that great? I was just like delighted and kind of surprised by the fact that I guess it sounds like she's not necessarily a Zelda fan, but her kids obviously are so that someone could still not know that much about Legend of Zelda and still enjoy the podcast. Made me feel all nice Perhaps, or maybe it was a Zelda light fan, you know, knows a little bit. She she knew enough to hashtag Zelda here in the tweet and and at least reach out to us. And so that is great. Super cool. Very exciting. Also, I like this idea of the kids were like, Another episode. <laughs> I suspect, though they, I'm sure that they're not young like that, or who knows what it is. I can't imagine, but that's cool. That yeah. uh, little unexpected treat there. That's really great. That's awesome. We also had a tweet from Still Saying Shane. We hear from Shane here and there quite a bit. He's a supporter of the show, and um, we enjoy our relationship with him. He kind of lives in the Midwest, by the way. I think he might be up in Wisconsin. Oh. Oh boy, there's another Discord chat going right now, Kate, about really? doing annual meetups and doing live shows for perhaps our opening episodes or finales for oh gosh. seasons. I got to get on that thing it's that you're talking be about. Very exciting. All of that's still in the works. Leon and I are trying to figure out all the logistics, but um, 
the chatter is happening and I'm so excited about the possibility of doing maybe like a season two opener. I think finales make more sense mm-hmm. every time we finish. This season we won't. We already know what we're doing for our season finale this season, which mm-hmm. will be back in, you know, in December. But anyway, um, I'm getting a little off topic. So Chris, uh, Still Sane Shane here said, and he's at Still Sane Shane, spelled the way you'd expect. Did you hear this rumor going around? Would you play it if it was true? And he had an image in his tweet of a graphic that heavily implied or just flat out represented mm-hmm. the Lego gaming style interpretation of a Zelda game. It was Link in little minifig form. Ganon uh-huh. is a minifig. And um, how do you feel about this, Kate? I gasped out loud and immediately showed Bill. I was like, look at this, because yeah. I am obviously a big Zelda fan. I am also a big Lego person ever yeah. since I was a kid. Well, I, I mean, think I, I have, see like a Disney princess castle behind you right yes, now. Yes, I have Cinderella Castle, about a third built. I've already built it once, then I tore it down because I wanted to build it again. Mm. Because maybe I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't know, but oh my gosh, I want... The Hogwarts Castle. There's a roller coaster that looks really cool that I just saw someone on Facebook post about. So yeah, Lego is my thing. Zelda is my other thing. How do you feel about the Lego games in general? So those I mostly like. They mm-hmm. do have a tendency to kind of do the same thing over and over and mm-hmm. over and over again. They are. It's not a secret. They are aimed, you know, towards kids to be able to. It's like the gameplay is repetitive so? and all that. <laughs> well, there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. I yeah. own. I think I own. A, I think I own the Star Wars Complete Trilogy Zelda game, and I did Lego buy game? the Jurassic Park Zelda game or Lego. Uh, Lego. <laughs> I'm switching the words here. Yeah. Lego Zelda. Yes, that would be cool. But um, uh, yeah, I have the Star Wars ones, and I and I think. Sometimes it it depends on how familiar you are with like the story that they're doing. Like, so I wouldn't necessarily buy all of them. I'm not going to get like the Avengers ones because I didn't see those movies, but I I have the Harry Potter. The only person on the planet. Probably. I have not seen Infinity War either yet, but anyway. Uh, Yeah, I haven't seen, I've only seen like Guardians of the Galaxy. That's it. But, um, but I have the Harry Potter Lego game. So I think it would depend on if you really connect with the story to make it worth playing that kind of same game over again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if there was a Zelda one, I would buy it in 0.2 seconds. I hear that a lot in, <clears throat> pardon me. I hear that a lot about Lego games where people can say like, Oh, I like that franchise that they're representing. So the Lego games fun enough to mm-hmm. go through the universe. Um, I've had some quite a bit of fun with certain Zelda games I, or Lego games. Wow. Um, <laughs> the Jurassic Park Lego game has a little bit of an open world to it. So I'll play okay. with my nieces. They'll jump around. I'll jump. It's There's something cool about like having Sam ne- or Alan Grant and I don't know, Chris Pratt's character, like jump in the same truck together and drive around, even though they're from different universes. And that is usually oh, the fun yeah. of Zelda games or Although, Lego games. I can't switch this variable in my head right now. And so the Lego games are usually based on movies, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, Indiana Jones is another one. So like, mm-hmm. you know, how would they do that? Well, the closest Zelda? I can think of is the Lego Batman games. Those are based on just kind of general universes. Okay. I personally think that this absolutely 100% is just a rumor. I don't see this happening anytime soon. I do think... Breaking my heart. I know. I do think Lego has been sp- expanding out with more and more of these franchises. Um, it also, Nintendo has been expanding out a little bit more with Nintendo Land coming out, with their development with Universal Studios, mm-hmm. Nintendo allowing certain third parties or second parties to create iPhone apps or mobile apps for some Nintendo properties. In recent years, the Nintendo themselves, the company, has been expanding a little bit. Maybe that lines up with there could be a Lego Zelda game, but I don't think that that is in the cards. I got to be honest. I hope one day. I don't. I think there's a lot of potential, but the I don't know how much. I mean, maybe it would be put some good story. I think the closest there. comparison would be like the Hyrule Warriors, where that was a completely different company. It was the people that make Dynasty Warriors basically mm. said, hey, let's do this, but with a bunch of Zelda characters. Mm-hmm. And Nintendo said, no problem. Um, and, you know, Hyrule Warriors is interesting. It's quote unquote in ca- timeline canon. But part of that canon is that it is not in the timeline canon. <laughs> like the game itself <laughs> is like the game itself is like in an alternate Hyrule. Oh. Blah, 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 blah. OK, I'm not going to lie. That game is something I have zero percent interest in. So kind of me as well. It's kind of fun to get the Super Smash Brothers Mario Kart kind of thing of like, let's get everybody. And even the Lego game thing of like, let's get everybody together sure. out of universe and play some game. But I don't know. I don't know if it works for me. So to my final point then is, is it, are you wanting a Zelda game that has a Lego skin or are you wanting a Lego game that has a Zelda skin? Lego game, Zelda skin. So that is not a Zelda game. 
You know, that would be a Lego game with repeating sure. simple tasks I'm okay and stuff with that. like that. Just because I have such a connection to Lego games specifically and right. Lego, I would be all for that. That's just my, I mean, that's me. I'm yeah. biased. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Uh, fair enough. We should keep moving because we have a lot of minutes cap to talk about. Lastly, I want to just point out a, an iTunes review that we got. We've been getting some wonderful iTunes reviews. Always very exciting. Yay. Quite exciting. Um, Ace Gray here, back uh, almost a month ago, actually, it has been a little bit of time, said, as a longtime Zelda fan, I am always up to hear other people talk about my favorite game gaming series. I really enjoy this podcast. Nice people with different... Oh, I'm so happy that he said nice people, oh, but I'll yeah. talk about that in a second. <laughs> he doesn't know me very well. Nice people with different opinions about Zelda come together and share their experiences. I am looking forward to every episode. Keep up the good work. Love, Ace. We should fight more. Love back at you, Ace. <laughs> no, we shouldn't fight. Just to bring a new <laughs> like, dynamic we all just get to along? it. No. Well, if I may, I, other, other comments have spoken Intrigue. to this point. I love the fact that you and I sometimes have very different opinions on certain parts of Zelda games, but ultimately we do enjoy celebrating them. Aw. Don't you think? That's nice. Yes. All right. I am going to be bringing up my show notes, but as I do that, Kate. Yes. Minish Cap. Mm-hmm. It is now the second mobile game you've played, I believe. Yes. The first being uh, Link's, Awa- Link's Awakening, which mm-hmm. we did talk about earlier in this season. Link's Awakening had some logistical challenges for you, if I recall. I'm excited for us to return to Link's Awakening, perhaps in season two, perhaps in season three. Certainly we'll be playing the Link's DX version. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll also be playing that the way that you played Minish Cap. However, I understand that when you played Link's Awakening, you played it kind of on an OG Game Boy Advance, not even an SP. Yep. No backlighting, yeah. nothing fancy, no bells or whistles. So back then you had the even older cartridge, yes. pl- you know, cr- cl- jammed into your Game Boy Advance. And I believe <laughs> that you played that entire game under a lamp, so uh-huh, to speak. Uh-huh, in my living room usually, um, underneath my lamp so I could see everything, which, you know, kind of limits the mobility and, you know, you don't have the color aspect to it in that version that I played specifically. So Minish Cap was definitely a different experience because with Minish Cap, you were kind enough to loan me um, the adapter for the GameCube that you can throw on the GameCube. So the Game Boy Player, one of the most amazing inventions ever. So awesome. So jealous that it was not mine and that I had to give it back to you, but Uh. (laughs) I need to find one. For myself, because are, it made it so much more fun to play, I think, yeah. being able to do that on a TV. So obviously the picture is much bigger. Mm-hmm. You have you have the ability to use the controller, which is just more comfortable yeah. in general. I use the GameCube controller, but okay, I know you right. can use... I think I gave you a cord where you can also plug in your Advance and use it literally as yes. the controller as well. Yeah, the only but, downside is you have to have it turned on, so you're technically using a little bit of battery power to do that. Mm. But I guess with WaveBirds and stuff these days, you're doing the same thing. And GameCube controllers are th- the best, so... I, wow. Oh, I, I also option. feel that they're one of the best controllers ever designed. Oh, yeah. With the exception so of the D-pad being a bit small, I think they're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I think it worked really well with the way that you have to play Minish Cap. You only have so many buttons that you can use, but I was mm-hmm. able to navigate it fairly easily mm-hmm. until you had to start using kind of like four different items. There's all, all every the mobile Zelda game always falls victim to the hot swapping. Uh-huh. That's just part of it. And it's always a little frustrating and you have to kind of deal with it. Maybe just maybe there could be a mobile game where you hold R and bring up a hot menu and then push a direction like mm. a bit like how you pull up certain things in Breath of the Wild. I just thought of. Yeah. 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 You know? Exactly. But it's not the case. So I do want to, I wanted to start this conversation with that Disclaimer that I think your logistical playing of this game certainly was more comfortable and and uh, well more comfortable yeah. than Link's Awakening. And I think it made a little bit of difference. Yeah. Um, the game itself made a big difference. So I can't say that you know my review is only based on how I was playing, but I mean just the the existence of there being the bright colors was a big deal as well. Just mm-hmm. made it nicer to look at and more fun to play, I think, and explore and walk around because you could tell the difference in what things were, (laughs) which sometimes was a lot harder in Link's Awakening. That's true. Um, So I I am curious to go back and play the, you know, the DX, right? The colorized version. Link's Awakening, colorized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To see if that um, affects my... Well, this has been an interesting journey because you hadn't played any mobile games. And so when I introduced you to... Link's Awakening. That was the first one that was like, it was like, we were, go- we're going in, we're going into the deep, dark, yep. old, old Game Boy game with all of the tropes and the, and the logistical problems of that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, I, I mean, there was a part of me that wanted you to play the Oracle series, then Minish Cap to kind of get treated to the evolution of how these mobile games worked. But instead we jumped to the end. Uh, I mean, at least for like these kind of top down, because of course we have Minish Cap or, um, 
Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks and mm-hmm. stuff like that happening on the DS. But as far as these kind of sprite-based 2D um, mobile games, we kind of jumped to the end, yep. Minish Cap. Now, Minish Cap came out about 14 years ago in 2004. Um, we've, I think we've <laughs> spoke in the past about how it was actually developed by Capcom, not Nintendo. Yep, and you can definitely tell a little bit. There is a mild tonal difference. Yes. So with all that said, I would love to start talking about characters and things like that. But yes, I do want to return one final time to um, your first impressions of the game compared to things like Ocarina of Time and compared to things like Link's Awakening. Ooh, those are two very different games to compare to. <laughs> right, but this game kind of fits with both a bit. Kind of, yeah. Um, so I, I did like the Capcom kind of graphic influence, and I had seen pictures of it when we were kind of discussing elements of this game on previous episodes, so I have seen screenshots and stuff like that, and yeah. that had already always really intrigued me um just the look of the game so um i like that a lot i liked exploring more in this game than in Link's awakening i think i felt more kind of free to roam around i felt that the map was easier to read it kind of gave you actual names of things like when you hovered over because or, um, oh yeah, Link's Awakening just gives you a little icon. Yeah, and, and so I'm like, what is this? But uh, yeah. but the Minish Cap map gave you like the names of the regions or whatever that you were kind of looking yes. at, or the buildings or what have you. Um, if I may, real quick, I actually found moving around the map. I found the map to be kind of frustrating in Minish Cap. It was one hmm. of the weaker spots for me because I really liked just unlocking one little square at a time mm-hmm. in Link's Awakening and also in the Oracle series. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. Whereas sometimes with Minish Cap, they would unlock this entire patch, but they would make you go from one patch just for a little corner into another patch. And sometimes that was a little misleading. um, And I felt like it was maybe just a touch unfair. But ultimately, yes, that map was very informative, more informative than Link's Awakening. Yeah. I did enjoy the overworld quite a bit. Yeah. And I liked uh, the map made... And the warping abilities made it way easier for me to get around. Like when I was. I don't remember the warping. Uh, cause you, in Minish Cap, you use the ocarina to, for the bird to, oh, it comes in and swoops fly you away. And I, I, and I used it a lot. I always use warping a lot. Mm-hmm. I know you like, you prefer to kind of run around very on rarely, foot or on horse. Or I very whatever. rarely warp cause it helps me memorize the land. Yes. And I don't care about that. So <laughs> I would just swoop off to someplace and the Minish Cap map made it easy for me to know where I was swooping to. Yeah, I was sure. like, okay, I know where I'm going and I know kind of the layout. So yeah, I actually preferred it cool but um there is let's talk about this there's an extra action button now there is that r button which mm -hmm. i think they basically map roll and pull and speak to Mm -hmm. a lot of times that stuff was put onto an item for link's awakening or um talking would have just been a double up on a how did you feel about having at least finally a third action button um i don't know i didn't i'm trying to remember it's been so long since i played so it has been about a month since we finished this game I played it on the Retron 5, you played it on the Game Boy Player. So we both played yeah, it up yeah. on the screen. Well, I guess since I nothing is really coming back to me, I didn't yeah. consider it to be a problem. <laughs> a problem or a good thing, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I guess either way. I was just kind of like, eh. The, the mm-hmm. controls, I guess, didn't have like a big effect on how I felt about this game. I Because like I said, I think the controller just made it easier to navigate them than yeah. using the Game Boy Advance itself. I'm going to guess that you put the sword on B a lot because that's yes. the same B that's with yes, yes, yes. Like, okay, now I know. Twilight Princess. Yep. And then the big A button becomes your item button, because the big the A item. button of the GameCube controller. Yes. And then probably the R shoulder then is R, unless you do the controller swap on Game Boy Player, but you probably, I'm not sure if you play nope. with that too much. Nope. No, that's Keep fine. That's it fine. simple, man. Yep, yep, yep. All right, cool. So um, other first impressions, then I want to do characters and stuff. Um, First impressions. Uh, Well, I agree with uh, the comment that you had just read about how it wasn't, I mean, it was still fun to walk around and explore a little, but it wasn't quite as immersive. And I think that's just a... a something that you're going to run into with the handheld versions. It's not going to seem expansive. It's not going to seem grand. And, yeah, it's true. You know, like... There is a little bit of epicness in some of the boss fights in this game. Yeah. There, more than other 2D uh, Zelda games. However, you're right. You don't get that kind of sweeping yeah. panoramic. Yeah, like what, some of my favorite parts of the console games are after you beat the boss and you can just kind of, you know, your little glowing portal is there and your heart piece is there and you can just kind of look around at this gigantic place you just battled this boss and I just cool. kind of like looking around and like this, there's this huge room and... And I don't know. I'm weird. So I think about like 
what other rooms are here and this there's this big building and I like imagining being in there. Which the world the 2D, building. Yeah, the 2D games don't they, have that. So I agree completely. I would kind of play the game and it wouldn't like affect me emotionally. Seems like a very dramatic word to use, but you know, it wouldn't just have that effect that the... 3D or console games do. So I actually completely agree. I think the 2D games are a bit more technical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I focus more on the puzzles in that one than the environment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and, and the puzzles themselves, um, I didn't find it, um, as difficult as Link's Awakening. I found them pretty simple for the most part until you get pretty late in the game. Can we talk about bombs? Kind of frustrating. Ugh, don't get me started on bombs. Well, wait, no, in this game, they telegraph where you should bomb finally. I definitely got stuck at one point because I had to bomb a secret flipping wall and I didn't know about it because they looked the same to me unless I was just very not observant. Well, in Minish Cap, they usually will do like, they'll put like two jars on the side and so you know to bomb in between. That was slightly more obvious. But or I they'll think put tiles on the ground then you kind of like, oh, I should probably bomb where this tile is. I am probably just not very observant. But um, yeah, because I would go back later and be like, oh, that does make sense for me to bomb that wall between those two pots, but oh, okay. I wouldn't necessarily get that right away. Like I wouldn't necessarily be like, Oh, that's obviously what I need to do here. Um, in one of the dungeons you had to get the mitts and to get the mitts, you had to bomb a secret. Oh, okay. And so I got stuck there. So, um, that to me was similar, more similar to Link's awakening, yeah. um, which that frustrates me. Um, because I think the wall should just look different, which in future games or other games it does. But like isn't it has part that crack of the... in it or now? Okay. <laughs> now. All right, because it's like if you can see where you're supposed to bomb, then why do you even have bombs? It could just be a key or a doorknob. Because door knob. I like things being told to me. <laughs> All right, I get it. I get it. So yeah, but the bombs are a little more telegraphed here, at least. I, I agree bit. that in Link's Awakening, when we play original Zelda, you're going to lose your mind. Yes. Because nothing's telegraphed this with the bombs. Not apparent. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. And that is a little frustrating sometimes. But um, um, yeah, there are some cool things in Minish Cap. I know in one of the temples, which we're going to get to the temples in, or the dungeons in a bit here, mm-hmm. um, like in one of the mines, you see that you have to bomb through one of the walls because if you actually go to a different tile, you can see that there's rubble, but on another tile, you don't see the rubble. So you, oh. it's cool Maybe stuff. Maybe I didn't see that. I like the ones that had like different floors where you could see below you. Oh, that yeah. Was cool. Let's save that for the dungeon when okay. we talk about the dungeons. But that's a cool element of this game is that there's a little bit of 3D. A little bit. Like not visuals. There's a little bit of 3D visuals, but there's 3D game mechanics game. Yes. in this game. Certainly th- that wasn't very present in Link's Awakening. There kind of was like, right. oh, you fall in a pit, get out of the pit in some of the boss battles. But yes, let's definitely talk about that. However, I want to talk about characters because we got to keep moving. Yeah. So we have a new villain for you uh-huh. and for most people. Mm-hmm. This villain is Vadi, and he maintains through what is kind of loosely considered the Four Swords trilogy, mm-hmm. which is this game. It starts with this game. It becomes Four Swords and then also Four Swords Adventures. All three of those games developed by Capcom, I found out. In okay. a previous episode, I was speculating that sort Four Swords was actually made by Nintendo because it used a lot of the Nintendo sprites, but I actually found out recently that it was Capcom. Oh. So they kind of handled this whole Four Swords thing. Um, we have Vadi. How do you feel about Vadi? No Ganon. Nope. I no- miss him. <laughs> yeah, I like fair Ganon. Enough. I don't know. It, it, it always throws me for a loop kind of when they throw a new main villain into yeah. a game, uh, Zelda game specifically. Um, creepy giggling. That's always a fun element of a villain. That seems to be a frequent common element of villains in general is a creepy giggle of some kind. Yeah, there so is a bit of we that. have that. He um, has his emo hair a bit like uh, the guy from Skyward Sword. I can't remember his name right now. Uh-huh. Oh, geez. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> well, you can only see one of my eyes because my hair is in front <laughs> yes. because I'm mysterious. Look. And I... Uh, I don't know. He seemed to be very angry for not a very good reason. Also, if the worst you can do is either turn someone into a statue or a hat, <laughs> not that scared of you. <laughs> like, that's the most, that's the best you got. I love it. Really? Yeah. Vadi does leave something to be desired for me as well. I will confess. I feel like he might show up again in Phantom Hourglass if I'm remembering correctly, but that could be a different bad guy altogether. Let's talk about our new Navi character, mm-hmm. Mr. Ezlo. Yes. <laughs> I have so many mixed emotions about Ezlo. Me too. I don't know if I like him or not. Let's mm-hmm. talk about him from a character point of view first and then a game mechanic point of view. Okay. Since we're doing characters right so now. So character, he is definitely one of the humorous elements of the game. And there that I, I found little tiny comments here and there to be pretty funny. They mention it 
teeny tiny shield and other so like so they're couple funny characters but he has the main humor mechanic where he's always talking about how terrified he is of everything like oh uh-huh. oh no we're up in the sky I'm so scared yeah you know what he does say that yeah <laughs> yep um so I know I mean made me giggle a couple times but I didn't like the sound effect that they use <laughs> yeah that was whatever not, it is that was not so pleasant to listen to um art style wise he is very animated like it's pixel art but he's very mm-hmm. stretchy and squashy when he talks mm-hmm. I, I oddly found that a little annoying but I don't want to be a hater on it. it's no big deal <laughs> But um, um, that this entire game is pixel art, but it is in the style of Wind Waker. We should point that out, mm-hmm. which obviously Link's Awakening and the Oracle series are not. They have their own thing. We spoke to this a little bit in our Evolution of Art Styles episode. Yeah. But I want to talk about one more thing, and then we'll get into Ezlo as a mechanic. Um, Link and Zelda have a have, – let's talk about their relationship in this game. Let's talk about Zelda in this game. For you, what are, what are your thoughts on her position? I will start this out by saying, like, they're – clearly like friends right off the bat yeah she yeah. she visits link at his house just like hey what's up in the mm-hmm. beginning of the game yeah and it is another game that bums me out and that she's basically useless almost she gets statuified right pretty early yeah. that is a bummer yep and then yeah i never like when she is just unable to do any literally anything um she's trapped in some kind of thing which is you know a staple of most of the zelda games and i'm glad they kind of got out of that a little bit in breath, at least giving her more um, cutscenes and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, at least with the story. A little more right. story. She but is literally trapped, I think, in the castle in breath, but she's active in this kind of spiritual this, sense. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, Twilight so, Princess is like the opposite of this experience, if I may, where she's this regal yeah. person that Link doesn't even know who she is. Right. So here are their friends, their kids, their friends. Yeah, and I wish I wish there was more to do with her. I wish she had not been trapped right away. Maybe like you know her dad gets trapped or statuified or whatever. Yeah. But but then it would have been cool if there was more stuff for her to do. You know, Leona and I were doing a interview, a PR interview the other day, and the um pub the. The writer asked us, you know, are you what is the main goal of Zelda? And we got on the topic of like, are you saving Zelda? And we were actually speaking to the point that um, you often aren't necessarily literally saving Zelda in a Zelda game. Some of the earlier ones, she's in a bed and you have to rescue her, for example, Mm -hmm. um, Link's Adventure. But um, many times you're actually just saving Hyrule is something that I certainly realized during that interview which I think is cool. However, this is a case where maybe we're saving Zelda, maybe we're not, maybe we're saving Hyrule, but mechanically we're basically saving Zelda. She's not. Right. She gets frozen in the beginning, she's inactive till the end. Mm-hmm. We're also trying to save the land. We're not trying to save someone that we're in love with, like a classic kind of castle, knights and castle kind of story. True, we're trying to keep the world from being taken over. By yeah, Fati. but mechanically here she kind of still is the princess in the tower and that's a little unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer. Um, going back to Ezlo. Let's do it. So he's, um, he's our hint person. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to comment on the aesthetics that were, that you were talking about earlier mm-hmm. with animation. It, he's just, yeah, less pleasant to kind of look at than a fairy or something kind of more floaty yeah. and. I agree. I remember seeing the artwork coming out for, to come out for this back in like 2003 when it was announced. Yeah. And you're like, and they took his, they took Link's gre- weird green long hat and they put it basically put a bird face at the end and had yeah. it stand up. Why and I was like, face? Oh, well, okay. I guess that hat kind of looks like a bird or whatever, or whatever, you know, that's what they're going to do. They're going to yeah. have a sentient hat. By the way, I saw some fan art about Ezlo and um, the Mario Odyssey Cap, Cappy or whatever his name is, oh. having a little chat. It was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, if I can find that, I'll throw it out on our Twitter again. But um, buddies. But yeah, so every Zelda game since Ocarina, for some reason, feels it needs a hand-holding character. And sometimes that's done a little bit better. In my ki- in my opinion, I think Mind is handled pretty well. Oh, yeah. Um, I think a, a sure. less good version of that is Fi or Fee from Skyward Sword. Yep. As though here, he's somewhere in the middle for me. Yeah, um, I do like that he tells you what you need to do when you come back to the game after a while. That was super helpful. So that is something you'll see in every single mobile game after Link's Awakening. Oh, okay. It's yeah. kind of like, hey, you've put the thing down, you've come back. Cause, because also there is a slight difference in mobile games and the console games is the console games. It's a lot. You're a little bit more in control of when you stop playing on a console. You're like, I have been sitting in this chair or on this couch or whatever. And I will now choose to stop because it's time to do whatever the next thing is. Mm-hmm. Sometimes with mobile, you might be opening up that Game Boy Advance SP just for on the bus. And then it's your stop, hypothetically speaking. Right. And you've got to close that, you know, that clamshell and keep moving. And so sometimes someone may have to stop playing any of the mobile games 
when they're not prepared to really retain, like, okay, I was there, I was there, I'll have to remember that next time. Right, exactly. And I think that's why we get that mechanic here. And I'm old and don't have any memory, so that was helpful <laughs> to me. <laughs> and I, you know, would stop playing for a couple of days or whatever because life, and then I would go back to it, and mm -hmm. I would honestly be like, I have no idea what I'm was what I just did and what I have to do next. So sure. luckily he uh, informed me, oh yeah, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it, how often he's talking about the very obvious things that are going on, but very helpful from a gameplay perspective. <laughs> it was like, okay, thank nice. you for reminding me. And he fits into the narrative enough, do. you know, Vadi curses him into this hat mm -hmm. because Vadi got upset and he was, and Ezlo was his mentor. Ezlo yes. being a, a cranky old man, is hard to understand until you see that he was an old man in one of the cut, mm. cut scenes, one of the flashbacks. Mm -hmm. um, but it's fine. I think we can keep moving from Ezlo. Maybe we'll speak about him a little bit more. But ultimately... This is basically a story about how Link got his hat, right? <laughs> so, you know what? I think Tandem Legends did a whole side chat on one of their episodes about, like, the Minish Cap. Is it... what? There's, like, three or four different ways that that name actually works in this game. Okay. Is it Link? Because the very final part of this game is Link... Getting a normal a cap. hat, yeah, right. Is that the Minish Cap? Is the Minish Cap as low? It may not be, yeah. I think you know what I mean. We think all these different things anyway. So much focus on a hat. I want to touch on some cameo characters or returning characters, yeah. And then I'd like to move forward. Um, so we, Mr. Beetle shows up in this game. We have a pseudo cameo by Beetle. We did not speak about him showing up in this game, or maybe I did mention it quickly in our favorite NPCs episode, but he runs one of the shops eventually in yeah, Hyrule Town. I never ran into him, so I didn't even know he was part of this game. You know, one time when I played, I, he did show up. It, so in Hyrule Town, there's clearly a market square in the mm -hmm. middle. And as you unlock other things, they're all kind of like side quests as you build up. You know how um, oftentimes in a Zelda game, you might have a parallel line of seeing the great fairies. And that gives you a bigger wallet and a bigger whatever, you know. And there's always a, a parallel side quest of the... Um, the, the the item chain, I call it. You know, it's sure. this item goes to this item to this item. And after 20 people, you get an item at the end. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, Leona and I are deep into that item chain in Oracle of Seasons right now. <laughs> nice. We were like, okay, we give the fish to the guy and that gives us a hamburger and we give the hamburger to the cat because the cat needs that and that gives us a mushroom. It's, it's all very, a little arbitrary <laughs> or convoluted sometimes, but that's a kind hamburger of- hamburger to a cat? There was absolutely not a hamburger in this game. I was just trying okay. to be silly. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so Beetle comes back. He is unlocked, but that's not really the right way to say it. He shows up in Hyrule Town um, after a certain amount of things are found and uh, you can buy potions from him and stuff like that. I and clearly cool. did not find enough stuff. I have a little- I have a little sprite of him here if you haven't seen him there he is art style wise he looks Aww. a little different but you can tell it's him can't you my buddy beetle beetle i am it's so weird because of this podcast and because of the way we spoke about him i'm like i'm his friend now <laughs> <laughs> or he's my friend in my imagination that's adorable um we had some gorons we also had the gorons in the zoo and i don't actually know if we had zoras in this game I don't, I don't think so. believe so. Mostly Gorons. But anyway, I want to get a little Gorons, more specific. Yeah. Our builders, our builders from Ocarina of Time show up. Yep. The guys running around with the boards. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's fun see. fun to talk to. Um, Dampe shows up. Yeah, that one was one I was definitely not expecting. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, because I don't know. I always feel sympathetic toward him. He has to work in the graveyard. I mean, that can't be the most fun gig. It's true. I agree. We also have a very um, cheekily titled Dr. Left. Dr. Left was the guy with the green hair. And that sprite might look familiar to you because Dr. Right shows up almost identically so in Link's Awakening. He's uh, the guy that runs the bookstore or has the books. Oh, uh, okay. Now, Dr. Right is actually an inside joke. It's a, it's a pseudo cameo to Will Wright, the creator of SimCity. Really? Yes. So Dr. Doctor Wright, well, not exactly. Um, Dr. Wright, he showed up as like Mr. Wright or something like that in SimCity for Super Nintendo because Super Nintendo actually helped develop the SimCity that came on the Super Nintendo. Nintendo helped develop the SimCity that came out on the Super Nintendo back okay. in the early days, whereas Mac, it was Maxis or whoever it was was making SimCity in other ways. So they introduced this character, Dr. Wright, Mr. Wright, whatever his name was, but he was designed to look a bit like Will Wright. So that character then gets brought into Link's Awakening and he is now a character in universe and he shows up here in Minish Cap. However, they have a little fun with his name and call him Dr. Left. <laughs> nice. Easter eggs. And it's then uh, we do also see Malin, which is mm -hmm. cute. She sings her little song every they, time you talk to her. Yeah. They do a nice thing with um, um, Lon Lon Ranch in this game. Yeah. It's actually a it's actually a stopgate. It's actually a little bit of a thing that helps you get to a new area. Yep. 
I liked seeing that. I, I mean, I like seeing any kind of location or character that I have seen before, especially in Ocarina. I'm like, oh, old friends. So, yeah, absolutely. And that was helpful in that I bought milk from her many times to kind of ah. yep, fuel me up. We need to, we're going to, let's talk about this and go to break. We must talk about the main, I'm looking at characters here that I have in my notes and I was going to start talking about the Minish and the Picori. I can't believe we haven't mentioned the main gimmick or mechanic of this game. Every Zelda game tends to have some kind of mechanic. Um, I'll call it a gimmick, but I feel like that's downplaying it a little bit, but mm-hmm. a design. Mm-hmm. Uh, either you're traveling back and forth in time or you're changing the seasons. In this one, you're changing your size. You're shrinking yes. down into little Honey, I Shrunk the Kids style type stuff mm-hmm. or you're at your normal size. How did you feel about that mechanic, that that theme in this game? I do feel, I want to say that I feel that this game definitely uses that mechanic quite a bit. You even use it in the dungeons, which isn't the case in some Zelda games with their main mechanic, if I may. How yeah. did you feel? And the bosses for you? in some of them. Yes, in a really cool way, which we will speak about after the break. Yeah, um, it was fine. I did. It didn't bug me at any point. It didn't make me go, oh, I can't believe I have to do this part again. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I was excited to, to shrink down or yeah. Really? yeah um i did really like the look of when you would um go through like the little tunnels so to speak or the mm-hmm. like the little pathways or up in rafters the, that was kind of neat yeah yeah oh that one was cool um so i liked the just the look of though that yeah. um i don't know i've always been fascinated and into like the honey i shrunk the kids movies and like sure. miniature kind of things Absolutely. so i liked the look of that a lot um I thought it was neat that when you were up in the rafters, they still rendered the actual sprites down below. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I thought that was really cool. Um, Some of the stuff where I could see, like, oh, there's a little tiny tunnel there, I wasn't necessarily interested in seeking out what Mm -hmm. to do with that. Right. um, Unless it was necessary to advance. So I'd see a little thing and I'd be like, okay, well, I could do this if I wanted. I don't know. There's a lot of those in Hyrule Town, by by the way, Hyrule Town, not Hyrule... Um, or I mean, not castle. No, I think it's Hyrule Village, and it's not Hyrule Town yet. Yeah, because this is when it was made. It was the first canonical Zelda game. Skyward Sword later was to be released and actually came before this in the timeline. Mm. But when this came out, this was the prequel story. Yeah, is what yeah, the, yeah. The concept was at the time. So it's Hyrule Village, not Hyrule Town yet. It, so that implies that this is the Hyrule that we understand to be in Ocarina and stuff like that. Though I'm not sure if that's the case now that I think about the timeline, which is nuts. Who knows? <laughs> um. Completely unorganized. I'm, I'm getting increasingly more and more comfortable with this kind of retconning of Breath of the Wild, just being like, clean slate. Anyway, yep. anyway, um, so there are a lot of places in Hyrule Village where there's these little tunnels and you do see them throughout the game. Right. And I do appreciate that eventually you have to find tracks through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So like you don't, they, they do play to the game. Many times the, the gimmick of a Zelda game will be informed by the system that it's on's abilities. So Oracle of Ages and Seasons, they did a play on changing color palettes of the sprites because we were finally on Game Boy Color. Mm. So how do you represent seasons changing? How do you represent time changing? You do different colors. Sure. Um, In Minish Cap, Minish Cap wasn't exactly, but it was loosely a, or not Minish Cap, the uh, Super Game Boy Advance was loosely a Super Nintendo squished down. Some of the chips and the architecture were different, but its abilities were very close to that, even though technically it was also kind of 32-bit and stuff like that. But I digress. What the Game Boy Advance was able to do was use Mode 7 style graphics. And Mode 7 is whenever the Super Nintendo would grow and shrink things and rotate things in games. Mm. The most famous example of that would be Mario Kart from Super oh, Nintendo, yeah. the ro- the rotating panel on the bottom that's all just one sprite, uh-huh. one massive bitmap or something like that, that they rotate. So there is a lot of Mode 7 style manipulation in this game. Uh, every time Link shrinks down, they actually take that sprite and they're shrinking it down. They're not actually, those aren't animated sprites that's, that's math doing that. That's code Whoa. doing that shrinking. Um, whenever he, a lot of the enemies rotate and stuff, a lot of the bosses rotate and use Mode 7 style graphics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that when the Game Boy Advance, when Capcom was tasked with creating a Game Boy Advance game, they were thinking, as often as the case with Zelda games, like I've already pointed out, well, what can this system do and what's a new thing we can do? Yeah. And that'll become our mechanic. And so I think that's where the shrinking comes from. Yeah. And I, I appreciated it that it was something different, something new. And it was, like I said, I like the look of it a lot. It didn't annoy me. I didn't feel stuck by it or anything like that. Yeah. But I also wasn't going to go into extra little tunnels and things just to do it. Fair um, enough. Fair yeah. enough. Overall positive. Kate, I think we're going to, um, oh, I did wanted to point out really quickly too that this game also came out on the Nintendo 3DS Virtual Console and also the Wii U. 
Oh, really? Mm-hmm. It oh. is available uh, for download on Wii U. I almost Wii U down- was like the one thing I never had. You know, it's so weird. I got a Wii U very, 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 very late, and I'm loving it. Hmm. I know, I know. It had its. It wasn't handled well in the marketplace. It didn't seem to be the most popular. I think Switch system. is amazing, but I'm actually adoring my Wii U right now. All right, let's go to break, Kate, and we're going to come back and we're going to do a push through all the dungeons. There, there's Ooh. aren't as many in this game as other games, um, but we're going to do it. I think there's six total, if I counted correct. Awesome. Correctly. All right, I'll see you in a bit. Okay, bye. Hey everyone, David Geisler here, and I am very excited to share that we have just launched our Patreon page for another Zelda podcast. Patreon is a great way for creators to grow their content, and we're really looking forward to using this space as a way to say thank you to our listeners. We'd love to have your support, and we've put together some rewards that we're pretty excited about. Things like additional uncut bonus content, custom wallpapers, and of course, early access to all of our episodes. So if you'd like, after the show, head on over to our page at patreon.com slash another Zelda podcast. You can also find a link to the page in our show notes. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. I'm Leona Liu. And I'm Jeff Norman. And we're the hosts of a new show called the T-Fix Podcast. Now, we love drinking tea. And we love talking about drinking that tea. So we decided that we should make a show about drinking tea. And so we did. The T-Fix Podcast. Now, in this show, we talk about some of our favorite teas, flavors, and cultivars. We do deep dives on all the different types of teas and many ways to make and store tea. Each recording, we enjoy a new tea from our personal stash. And we try not to get too tea drunk in the process. A new episode comes out every other Thursday. And you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and YouTube. You can also find us on Instagram at the tea fix. All right, everyone. We'll see you there. Hey, everybody. Welcome back from the break. Kate Fisher, while we were on break, you pointed out that there was actually a few other things about the game that we haven't yet spoken about. So before we dive into the dungeons... Yeah, before we get into the nitty gritty. So sorry, pardon me. I was I got a little caught up in my throat there. Um, <laughs> let's talk about, you wanted to bring up the music a little bit. Yeah, well, just a quick note about that. Mm-hmm. Um, because some of the music is obviously very similar to other Zelda games, but then you have yeah, like yes. the little minish music that you would hear whenever you go into like the little minish neighborhoods. And I really liked that song. I think there's legit, there's definitely like the shop theme is right out of Ocarina. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's That's the what Ocarina I like. song. So I like the mixture of familiar music and new music. And I had actually, um, I think just for funsies one time gone on YouTube and just looked for like best Zelda music to Ooh. see what people thought, you know, top 10 list or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the minish, theme was definitely on those lists um, that I found. And at the time, this was before I had played the game. So then once I got to the game, I was like, oh, I do. Yeah, I do agree. It's a really nice little tune. I think definitely for a handheld system, the music's pretty epic, pretty well-rounded. Yeah. I liked all of the music for the for the dungeons, for the overworld, everything. I just like the tunes. Yeah, it's a nice little Hyrule theme when you're out there um, Mm -hmm. in Hyrule. You get the gun, 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 kind of reinterpreted in a oh, few yeah. different ways. I think they even slow it down at one point in like a mysterious area. It's always like coming home when you hear that song. <laughs> you know, there are, uh-huh. that is that is a good nostalgia moment in any Zelda game where yes. you first hit Hyrule Field, presumably. Mm-hmm. And, and if, if you're in the kind of game, if it lines up just right and that song starts as well, it's always a nice feeling. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. Two other mechanics. Yes. Kinstones and figurines. Yes. Now, um... Hmm. Well, let's do Kinstones first. Okay. Um, um, also, I, before we get into Kinstones, I want to say that I have now played this game twice, only twice. When it originally came out, I played it on, actually, I had it in my like Nintendo DS. You know, I was doing what you did with the mm. old Game Boy game and Game Boy Advance. Yeah. I had this cartridge plugged into the bottom of a DS and played it just on the top screen. So I had the R button and stuff over there on the side. Um, I liked Minish Cap the first time I played it, but there were some things about it I didn't care for at all. Mm -hmm. The Kinstones being one of them Mm -hmm. at the time. So so are you saying that has changed? This time around, I loved them. Really? And I I don't normally like dumb collect stuff and mix (laughs) stuff together stuff. What changed? What happened? Um, I think... I think I just wrapped my head around it a little bit more. Instead of thinking that it was like attacked on collect-a-thing, there were legitimate... um, Rewards. Rewards. 
yeah, it actually were things that helped you. And so I just started collecting the Kinstones. The first time I played, I was like, what's this thing? I don't need it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Almost like the um, stray fairies in Majora's Mask. You're like, I don't need to collect these things. Oh, in Majora's Mask, there's fairies in the dungeons. If you collect five, 15 in a dungeon, stuff happens. Gotcha. Um, sometimes that stuff's a bit of a turnoff for me, arbitrary collection. Yeah, so I wonder if the same thing would happen to me if I played the game again, because I didn't give a crap. I think the first time I played, it was like too much to get an extra layer on there. This time, since I was familiar with the game, I was like, I guess I'll dive in one one layer deeper into the mechanics. Sure. So my thing was that um, I would always like fuse the kin stones, mm -hmm. which I, I feel like I always rolled my eyes when I saw that. They also used uh, Mode 7 graphics for that. Okay. When those things spin in, but anyway. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so I would do that, and then basically if whatever the treasure was or whatever the thing happened was nearby, I would maybe oh, go sure. for it. But if it's if this thing pops over way far away to where I can't warp there easily or yeah. I'm not going to be going there anytime soon, I immediately forgot because you have to remember where it is. I think you get little Maybe. icons on your map, but Maybe. I will completely agree with you that anytime I got a kinstone that opened up a secret somewhere, I very rarely went to see seek it out. Yeah. Sometimes I just, and sometimes I would just happen upon one. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, oh, okay, I kind of recognize this fountain. Yes. And I think there's something there. I'm going to go check it out, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes yeah. if it was convenient... I would see what it was. I treated them exactly the way I treat Korok seeds in Breath of the Wild. It's yeah. like, if I come across one, fantastic. Great. If I see one where it looks like, oh, that might be a one over there, I'll go do it. But I'm never like Korok hunting. Yes. Yeah. So same. Um, the other thing is, I wish I knew what the thing was that you got. That would definitely have yeah. given me some sort of you know, motivation to or go find it. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm interrupting you just a bit, but like, even if there was like a little bit of a recipe of like, Oh, this mix with this one usually creates that kind of thing. That could be kind of fun. Right. Um, but if it's like, Oh, 50 rupees, whoopee. There was like, a bit of that. Well, I, I think care. there was a bit of a tear. There's like the green ones popped up all over the place. Obviously the yellow, well, red, yeah. the different shapes. There's a few times where you must use the kinstone. So I'm glad they at least, yes. it was a little wedged in, but I'm glad they at least made it be more than just getting gems. And I think if I were more exploring oriented, um, like I know how you are, um, I would have had a better time with it, but because I'm so like linear and story oriented mm. and goal oriented, that kind of thing, I was just kind of like, eh. How'd you feel about the story? I don't want to get too far off because we got to do dungeons, but like, how'd you feel about the story in this game? The story in general, like the Vati and how he came to be. And then the reason for, I, I guess I mean like the, Sometimes when you when you play a really good immersive Zelda game, the entire time you're moving through Hyrule, so to speak, mm -hmm. you're led by an emotion that's fed from the narrative of the story. You're trying to do something. You're trying to save something. Sometimes with some Zelda games, that story takes almost a back seat, and you're like, I guess I'm just going to the next place. That's I guess that's the latter is how I felt about this one. Because, this one did, yeah, I felt a little weaker to me too. I'm sorry. Because like how we talked about before, how the 2D games are kind of more puzzle oriented. They're not as grand and immersive just by way of you know the limitations of mm -hmm. those games. Um, story wise, I wasn't particularly like motivated by that. Right. Um, the first thing that I thought of when you were just talking was Twilight Princess and how that's like in my head the whole time I'm going through that game. It's I like, I know what I'm doing. I know what my goal is. This is important to me. I'm not no. just arbitrarily solving puzzles or you doing are, this or that. You are led and fed by emotion while you're playing Twilight Princess. Right. This one, I mean, I knew there was, you, you know, you had to collect the elements to be able to power up your sword. So that was a good motivation, I mm -hmm. suppose, you know, going through it like, oh, I know that eventually my sword will be more powerful. I'll have maybe an easier time with the game. Right. So that was a good motivation. Yeah, there was but, the literal like getting another figure with the four swords thing. Yeah. So I guess it wasn't that, just like you got stronger sword plus five. It was, oh, actual puzzle. It became a, a upgrade, but it was a puzzle mechanic yeah. because obviously you'd start using that where you start lining link up. There's three links to hit different things, four links to hit different things. Yeah. That's kind of cool yeah. as we, as we speak about it. So yeah, I guess less, less immersed in the story yeah. and more disinterested in the puzzles. I think the Kinstones were a layer on the game. I'm sure one of the developers came up with it. I'm sure it was like thought up in a think tank meeting for this game at the Another time. Another kind of something yeah, like, different to do. Yeah. And this was, I think at the time when this first came out in 2004, we were kind of fresh off of, Pokemon Red and Blue, Oracle mm. Seasons and Ages, essentially Red and Blue. This kind of marketing of like collect a thon kind of things or like collect and mix them and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I did feel that. Um, Gotta catch them all. That 
the kinstones were tacked on a little bit that first time. This time, I think I had a different emotion, and it was kind of fun. But that leads yeah. us to the figurines, oh my which gosh. is literally got to catch them all. So stupid, though. So I think I did it once. I started like Maybe cashing twice. them in or whatever, or, you know, yeah. giving them my seashells and getting the figurines, and I was like, okay. But then what? Like what? What is? I think what you is just the have point? them to look at them and read them. So I think, and I had to look this up because I was like, I'm not going to keep doing this without knowing what the end result is. And in I this think case, you get like a piece of a heart. Fair enough. In this case, what if you get all the figurines? If you get all of them. I think yeah, you get a heart piece or something hmm. like that. I think you get rupees too eventually, but yeah. I, it just wasn't. Do you play? No reason for over me. the years. Have you played much Super Smash Brothers? No. I'm one of the, yeah. the so I'm one of the five people in the whole world that hasn't seen the Avengers movies and <laughs> one of the five people in the whole world that hasn't played a lot of Super Smash Brothers. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Super Smash Brothers is ridiculous with its what they call trophies. And every single mm. time you do certain tasks, you get these digital trophies, models of characters. And I think that's what um, this game was kind of referencing. It was building itself off of that idea. Gotcha. It's, you're collecting stuff, but it's a game, so it's not real stuff. It's not for the people who like to put things up on a shelf, which is cool if you're into that. This is like feeding that thing, like collect all the things and you get to go look at them is yeah. what it felt like for me. I need a reward, though. I need to, there well, must be a point for me to You know, it goes both stuff. ways. You can collect things in the physical world, in the corporal world, if you want to look at these things and they are changing your environment. That's kind of cool. Yeah. But when it's dig into two or three menus just to look at a sprite of a figurine, yeah. at least in Super Smash Brothers, it's a three-dimensional model that you can kind of zoom in and out and to kind of take a look at. And that's kind of fun, mm-hmm. a little bit. And I don't collect things in my normal life, so I guess that makes sense why I wouldn't really yeah. care about it in a I, game. I collect things less as well, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so yeah, the figurines, both of us were a little meh, little meh on that. Yeah. Um, so speaking about the Kinstones and collecting these uh, upgrades and the four different... So, oh, let's do this. So we're going to start talking about dungeons. Okay. But this is one of the times, one of the Zelda games that kind of mixes up the the thing you're trying to collect a little bit. There are one, two, three, four, five, six dungeons in this game total, but there are only four gems that you're collecting. Mm -hmm. Where Remember when we were doing Wind Waker, we complained about uh, one of the gems was just given to you by the Jaboon character. (laughs) But typically, like in Ocarina of Time, or even for the most part, I understand A Link to the Past, you... You need eight things to make the Triforce. You need eight things to make the thing. So you go to eight dungeons and there it is. It's Mm -hmm. one to one to one to one. Yes. Absolutely the case in Ocarina of Time. Let's use that as our staple. In this game, they mix it up a little bit on you. You go to one of the dungeons. I think it might be Forest of the Winds. And you find out that you get to the end of the dungeon and it's gone. The thing you need is gone. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. And then they go, well, I guess we got to go to another dungeon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I, for me, I was, I was oddly invested in the story as far as that's concerned that I was like, okay, that's fine. Like I didn't feel cheated or anything. I did this. How do you feel about it? It was only collecting four things. We had six dungeons. Did that affect you at all? No, I don't think I minded that necessarily because each dungeon was its own cool little puzzle and yep. not until the very end did they get like frustratingly difficult. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I just worked and worked and worked and worked at this thing for no reason yeah. or no item that I have gotten. So yeah. yeah it does ramp up there. It does ramp up. Yeah. Yes. I think, you know, Zelda games, okay, fine. The overall explanation is a, a lot of fun when it's at its best, but for the most part, Zelda games are known for their dungeons and people look forward to the dungeons. So yes. if you get through a dungeon and there isn't that thing at the end, but I mean, it was let's still face a it, fun process. It's just, a, that's just a product of the narrative. They could have said, okay, five gems, but they said it's four gems and oh, this one's not here. We got to go to another place for the motivation. Right. Twilight Princess actually kind of plays around with that format a little bit. And I enjoyed that about Twilight Princess. Mm-hmm. When you really count the dungeons in Twilight Princess, it's like, this is pretty close to Ocarina, but they created a storyline where you have to Kirk, you know, do the first four and then all of a sudden you need the mirror of Twilight and that's another three dungeons. Mm-hmm. And it's when you kind of look behind the curtain, you're like, oh, okay, this is our seven dungeons, but at least the story updates you and gives you different reasons to go to these dungeons. Right. I was not upset by having like an item not at the end of the dungeon because at the end of the, I was more upset about not being able to do a dungeon and getting an item in Wind Waker than doing a dungeon and not getting an item. I agree. I agree. I'm like, I have to work at this. I need, I need it to feel worthwhile. Well, I was, I was watching a um, YouTube series the other day called Boss Keys and this gentleman was reviewing dungeons all across the, the Legend of Zelda series. It's super cool. I highly recommend it. 
I don't remember the name of the actual YouTube channel, but it was a series that he did. And um, he was speaking about one of the things that is cool about Zelda games. It sometimes doesn't happen in other games is that for the most part, Zelda dungeons, a lot of times in video games, the dungeon is the thing that the stuff happens in. So here's a room and we put a bunch of baddies in there. We put a puzzle in there. Mm -hmm. Zelda games, the dungeon is is the thing. So it is the puzzle. It Completing the dungeon is the fun thing. Getting through the dungeon is the fun thing. It's yes. not just like a corridor that you're going through to do other fun things. Oh, definitely not. No, you know? whenever I come up to a dungeon in Zelda, I'm like, all right, Let's here we go. Like, I always need to make sure I have at least an hour of free time because I'm not going to, you know, just throw in the towel halfway through this thing. Like, this yeah. is the the main, uh, one of the main events. So I always feel like this sense of, okay, we're going to get ready to do the significant piece of this game right now. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So uh, not having that item at the end one final time, it yeah. was like, I still got to do the dungeon. That's the actual reward. Yes. It was a lot of fun. I agree. Um, um, okay, so let's start here. The first dungeon we come across is fairly early in the game. I, there's not a lot of side quests that happen before it, a la Twilight Princess or something like that. But we actually enter the Deepwood Shrine shortly after meeting Ezlo he brings us down. We start to learn that we can shrink. And the Deepwood Shrine, we've spoke about it briefly in our forest episode, episode like two of this season. Yeah, back when I had no idea what it was. Well, now you do. Yeah, I do. Um, I'll let our audience know if they're not familiar. One of the cool mechanics of this very first dungeon is that it's actually a teeny tiny little dungeon hidden in the forest, but you shrink down and go in. Mm -hmm. So you're, dealt, you're dealing with a lot of normal size, like a bug all of a sudden is the size of you. Yes. Um, famously, the boss for this dungeon is like a blob, one of those blob things, but it is enormous because you are small. So it's rendered also in um, um, mode, mode 7 graphics. That's what's allowing it to slide. I'm going to say that a lot in this episode. Gotcha. But anyway, so now that you know what it was, what was it like for you um, to approach this dungeon, to be introduced to this dungeon? Let's talk about it a little bit. I liked this one. I especially like the barrel Part. I thought that animation was really cool that is more and mode seven. the mechanics of that were really cool. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that was the first thing in this game where once I got to it, I was like, whoa, this special is effect. neat. Yeah, I so, like being able to run up and down the barrel walls and move it to change the rooms that I could access. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a really cool Yeah, part you step of it. inside a barrel and it starts rolling and the view from the screen is looking down as if you are to be looking at the bottom of the barrel that you are standing in mm -hmm. and it rolls. Yep. I um, thought that was a yeah. really cool uh, element to it. And I like that that was kind of the hub of the whole thing. So yes, yes, yeah. And it was a cool way to do the hub. Instead of just walking into a room and having five doors, mm -hmm. you walk inside a barrel and the way you roll it opens up different paths and things like that. So you're in control of it. It's very cool. Yes, I liked it. Um, and then we had the gust jar is what you end oh, up yes. getting. That happens very early in this game. Yep. Usually you get those blower sucker things halfway through the games. Right, yeah. So that's... That was cool to use. Um, I think it took me a couple, a little while to figure out all of the things I could do with the gust jar. Sure. Um, like sucking the mushrooms towards you? Yes, exactly. There that took is. me a while to figure out. I was like, how do I do this exactly? Yeah, those mushrooms are interesting. They basically work in three phases. They teach you that you can pull on the mushroom, and then you learn that maybe you shouldn't pull all the way on the mushroom, and then you <laughs> later learn that you can suck the mushroom to you. All of these are ways to cross water chasms and things like that. How does a mushroom work like that? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I know. These are super, stretch. stretch, super stretchy mushrooms. Yeah, you know. But it's a great example of... Um, uh, having a, pu a puzzle theme, working on a theme. It's mm -hmm. not just a brand new puzzle every room. It's like, oh, I kind of know what this mushroom does, but now I'm going to be using it in a different way. Yep. And the gust jar definitely, or the, yeah, gust jar definitely does that, even though it kind of sucks more than it blows. Well, I guess it's both, isn't it? <laughs> I guess. I didn't. The gust jar it's sucks. Not, <laughs> it sucks. It's not my favorite item to use either, but uh, I do yeah. like that it keeps popping up later in the game as something that you can use to your advantage. You don't have to use it, but you can. Sure. Well, you um, definitely use it in the like second half of this dungeon very much in a, yeah. a pseudo-physics kind of puzzle. I mean, like later in the game, like you yeah. can you can bring it back if you want to. You don't have to necessarily use it, but sometimes it's more useful in certain situations than other items may be. So Absolutely. That's a cool element. Did you enjoy using the gust jar to blow yourself around on a lily pad? 
It's it's similar to a Deku Leaf in Breath of the Wild. Uh, I never really like doing that kind of thing in Zelda games, to be honest. It's a little like, okay, I have to press this button 50,000 times to get yeah. somewhere. So, eh. yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit of a bummer that you have to charge it. You know, you could either hit it a lot and it moves a little or you charge it up, it moves you a lot. It was okay. And then you'd bounce off the walls, though, too. Like if you went too yeah. hard or too far, you would just bounce off the wall and go right back to where you started. That totally was a little true. frustrating. So, eh. Yep, fair enough. Another way to use it, but yeah. Another way to use it. Absolutely. So let's see. That does bring us to um, our main boss, which is the oversized choo-choo. I call it the blob, but of course they're choo-choos. Because yes. <laughs> um, they're blob-esque. So this massive choo-choo comes in, and it's a lot of fun. Of course, the, it's very cool that the very first dungeon, you almost forget you're small by the end of it. Yeah. You almost and forget like, that you're standing oh on a lily pad, and this humongous <laughs> choo-choo comes in. And, and it only takes a second, but you realize, no, that's a normal one. Right. Um, and this boss was... Not difficult. I think it took me a minute to figure out how, what to do. Yeah. But then once you figure out what to do, I think it's pretty easy to. I think it's a very good defeat. first boss. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of puzzle, a little bit of panic because it's big. Yep. So you definitely get the uh, the uh, adrenaline going a little bit. And it can fall on you. It starts falling around. <laughs> it's not too much. There isn't too much danger. There aren't like projectiles coming out or anything. Right. But, so you can avoid if you're crazy. keeping up with things, you can avoid this boss and everything. The choo choo comes down. You start learning what you can do and what. What do you get? Do you get, you actually? I don't know if you get anything. I think you've just already got the gust jar element. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So item wise, you get it. Yeah, this is one of those games where you don't get items at the end. You get them in the middle. That is actually pretty common for Zelda games. Mm-hmm. And I think that that uh, Choo Choo guy comes up later in the game. He's a mid boss, like yeah. in the fourth dungeon. Yeah, or something. yeah. So that's basically the game's forest temple, which, like I said, yeah. we forest dungeon, which we spoke to in episode two. Our next dungeon, we kind of spoke about, we very much spoke about in our fire dungeons episode. Again, so when I had no idea what it was. A little bit of return. So you didn't know you were not familiar at the time. My notes are not loading right now for the, it's the cave of flames. Yes. So, yes, I'm, I'm not going to try to set this one up. I want you to tell me about what it was like finding the Cave of Flames and going to the Cave of Flames for you. Um, To get there alone kind of took a little longer it did. to climb up the mountain. And yep. it took me a while to figure out how to get up the mountain in the first place because it's like, you can't climb this right now. Stop it. Like <laughs> The overworld is a little bit more puzzly in this game. Yes, yes, very much so. So once I finally figured out how to actually get there, the Cave of Flames itself, I have in my notes, it was pretty challenging with the lava elements. Elements, but mm-hmm. I thought it was fun, like fun challenge. Do you like the minecart? Yes. Sorry, it took me a minute to yep. remember that. I know. Yeah, I I always like minecart and cart related. Well, you are gonna like mechanisms. ages and seasons then. Very oh. much. Each one easily has a dungeon that completely revolves around minecarts, and this is also Capcom. There's the next version, so I remember playing mm. Minish Cap and getting on the minecart and being like, I know this. This happened in the, the Oracle series. And there's a there's a little minecart action, gosh, actually in a couple of those Zelda games. So you have the, mm-hmm. in uh, Skyward Sword, you have the minecarts with the time shift stones and all that. Which is super those. cool. I like that a lot. And then there are a couple of minecarts in Breath of the Wild, too, that you can... You're absolutely right. Right on. And actually, so. I saw, I have not, we have not, both of us have not played, neither of us have yet played... Um, a link between worlds, but I uh, understand that there's some minecart stuff in that one too. Oh, they really like minecarts, don't they? <laughs> well, I think you it's know, Oracle, the Oracle thing. series started this idea. A minecart is interesting because it's essentially a warp pipe in Mario Brothers. Like mm-hmm. it's like you can't really get on or off it. You can do things. Or do things while you're you on. You can it. Indiana Jones it and try to hit it with a shovel. You know, to take a different course. <laughs> uh-huh. Of course, it's your sword, not a shovel. Um, which is kind of fun to like work with the puzzle as you're doing it, but that's that's the most part. So uh, let's see. We actually get the cane of Pocky in this dungeon. Yes, which you've talked about before. I kind of enjoyed it. It's fun. Um, so it's a it's a new take on an item. Yeah. So that that's the reason why I did like it is because it's something different, something that is a new kind of item slash weapon idea. Um, so the the, the, I... the the conceit with cane of Pocky is that it uh, you you. You know, we wave this cane and a little magical poof goes out and whatever it touches, it will flip over. Right. And so that can be used as a weapon that can be used as something to flip rocks over if you can't break them. Mm -hmm. Uh, It can be used. There's a couple characters that have spikes so you can flip them over and then expose their gooey underbellies. (laughs) Gross. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I don't know. I I didn't like that. I couldn't use it on everything like there are only so many things that you can oh, really? use it on i was impressed by how many things i could use it on oh well yes here's one of those things that we disagree on 
I like it. I don't like it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I used it when I had to in here, but it's not necessarily a weapon that I, or item, rather, that I came back to and used a lot after this. Yeah. Uh, I, unless I had to. I use it progress. a little bit sometimes up there in the mountains later in the game. But, um, mm-hmm. yeah, so the cane of Pocky, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have a cool boss in this one. Oh, yes. Glee Rock. Glee Rock, which is a play on... Glee, Glee, Glee Rock or something from the original Zelda, by the way. Oh, see, I don't, some Glee, of these Glee things Rock. I just don't I'm getting know. the name wrong. Uh, it's a dragon. Uh, so yes. that's one of the dragons. That's the dragon. We, that was in our favorite bosses episode. Actually, I spoke about that character. Yes, it's the th- two to three headed dragon, depending on what dungeon you're in, in the original Legend of Zelda. This is a take on that. Um, this dragon is a dragon that comes up out of the center mm-hmm. of the play field there's lava around this character and the dragon slaps its head down and does different things so even though it's a dragon it reminded me a little bit of the dragon in the fire temple in ocarina mm-hmm. it reminded me a bit by name of the dragon in the legend of zelda but i would argue that fundamentally this is more what we sometimes call a plant-based boss not a dragon-based boss you and i have spoken about bosses like the plant-based bosses are usually there's a pod or a hub in the middle of a room yep. and it reaches out and does things to you can you explain uh, to our listeners what this boss is like a little bit? Um, well, I definitely had written down that it took me longer than I expected to beat it. And yeah. I think that's because it would just kind of, from what I remember, and again, it's been a long time since I played this, but it mm-hmm. would kind of shoot out at you, right? So uh, the dragon has a big, long head and it will, yes, it'll shoot fire at you. So you have to run around. The lava goes up and down a little bit to give you less space to walk. But yes. ultimately it will reach across the lava and try to bite you That's and get you. Yeah. And if and it misses you, it gets stuck on the ground and then you have an opportunity to attack it and go up its back to the pot in the middle uh-huh. and hit the pot and hit the flower in the middle. I mean the gem. I mean the back. <laughs> Whatever it is. And it hit me too many times. Like I just, I don't know, maybe I was running exactly where I should not have been running, but it took me longer than I... Uh, like to admit to yeah. beat this one. The only thing that was really frustrating, I kind of liked it a little bit. Um, the only thing that was genuinely frustrating is that I kept just grazing the lava and then you have to deal with 10 seconds of Link running like a maniac. Yes, I hate that. I hate that in any game, the Mario games are the worst with yes. that kind of thing. I understand that it's punishment without taking out life or right. health or whatever, but it is well, very doesn't frustrating. Doesn't it also take away life? You know, I think it does in this game. Does I was that like, as and I was, you run around like a crazy person? As I was saying the sentence, I was thinking about that. Um, any other standouts for you with this? It's our, it's a classic fire dungeon. Um, I don't think I have anything specific. I just remember it mm-hmm. being a fun challenge. I almost always like the fire dungeons. I think the most out of like the forest fire water. Oh, you have mentioned that. Can ones. I ask you real quick? How does this one compare to some of your favorites? I, I liked it. It, it was early enough in the game where it wasn't stupid difficult. Yeah. It added more challenge than the deep woods, you know, Right. One. So it added a couple more elements of uh, challenge and I I liked it. I don't you know what? Really liked it. I just I'm starting to realize that I don't know if the mine carts are actually in this one. They might be in the Palace of Winds because that's also an underground. That's where you get the mitts and start digging around. Hmm. Isn't that the one with the mine cart? I'm forgetting. But anyway, <laughs> we'll keep going. So next you learn that you're going to go hit the Fortress of Winds, not yes. yet the Palace. Fortress of Winds, because at this point in the narrative, you're starting to learn through Ezlo that there's another race that lives up in the sky. Which that he is terrified to get to because it's so high up. And so you have two of your elements, uh, fi- uh, forest and fire, which is very common in Zelda games as the, as the early elements. Mm-hmm. And so you head to the Fortress of Winds in an attempt to kind of connect with these people or at least get the the element that they left behind. Yes. So I, we, yeah, so we go to the Force of the Winds. Oh, Force of the Winds has all the digging too. I am, these are blurring for me. I'm so sorry. So we, to let everyone know, we did delay this episode. We played just by circumstance. We had to We played this game for review a few months ago. Yeah. We finished playing it almost 2 months ago. We were going to record our Minish Cap episode a month ago, and we had some technical difficulties that day. Yes. So we have now put it into this batch of recordings. So, so it my is brain doesn't work l- anymore. It is blurring a little bit. Forgive us. Overall, I enjoyed this game very, very much. The end. Okay, great. Goodbye. See you all next week. <laughs>
So anyway, um, so we go to the Wind Ruins. The Fortress of the Winds is where we're getting the mole mitts and all that kind of stuff, which is cool because the, the mole mitts are a kind of a new version of the shovel. You're actually digging sideways, not just down, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You didn't like it so much? Mm-hmm. It was, I had mixed emotions about it too. So part of it was like, cool, I can dig anywhere. This is so fun. It feels like Mario Brothers too. And um, apparently that's how I speak. I got to stop doing that voice. It's really odd. <laughs> it's weird. It's like my version of how I think I sound. I do not think I sound that way. So, um, but you can dig around anywhere you want. And that is kind of cool and kind of not. Maybe this is also expressed with all the sand stuff in Skyward Sword in years to come Mm. when you're like sucking all the sand up and blowing it away and stuff like that. I don't care for the digging elements of it. And in my notes, I have Fortress of Winds, colon, boo. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) I might agree a little bit. I had to look up a walkthrough for this one. I got stuck. This is where I- Always kill the fun. I know. But this is where I got stuck in that I had to bomb the secret wall to get the mitts in the first place. And I got to this point where oh, I like. that's the one I'm talking about. That's the wall where if you walk on the path above, you can see that there's a, a damaged spot. So oh, when you go to the geez. other tile, then you know. Yeah, but I anyway. would not have put those together. So in this dungeon, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm stuck. I can't do anything. What am I supposed to do? And that's why I had to look up the walkthrough and it's okay. like, oh, you use your mitts. I'm like, what mitts? Mitts? Mm. What? What is? What are these? I don't have these. They are a new item to the Zelda style or whatever, these mitts. They kind of show up mm-hmm. later as well. Don't they show up in Skyward Sword actually? They do. They do indeed. That's right. And um, and I didn't care for them in that game either, that's honestly, because the you dig in the ground and you'd get like 10 rupees. Oh, good. I'm so glad I dug that hole. In Skyward Sword, they felt very tacked on. It felt very context sensitive. Yeah, I'm sure it was just kind of like a little, remember these? Mm-hmm, remember mm-hmm. these things? Yeah, remember right, the other yeah. Game? Yeah, oh, we gotta put another one of those in. Yep, so, um, did not care uh, for the mitts as an item, especially in the cloud level, so over that by then, like, the mitts, I just, uh, yeah, don't care. Yeah, totally. Not fun. Totally. Um, so I yeah, yeah. The digging is interesting. I'm pulling up my notes here on I, the boss. I liked the boss. I bet you can tell why. Uh, because I think we have a little cameo from Twilight Princess here. Or to Twilight Princess. Did Twilight Princess come later? The Dark Knot? Oh, it's not. It's Oh, that was the mini boss. Was a Dark Knot. Oh, yeah, well, that's not what I'm talking about. You're talking about Mazal. Mm-hmm. So now this is, I've, I remember, this is not yet the big Deku thingy. Oh, yes. This is the face with the hands. Yes. Face with the hands. Because if Kate likes a boss, it's a disembodied pair of hands. Yes, it's true. <laughs> this is a common theme in Zelda games. We see this like executed usually very well. It was first done in Ocarina of Time with the drumming spirit thing. Which bongo, actually, bongo. Bongo, bongo. We might be speaking about bongo, bongo uh, two episodes from now. Uh, we certainly mentioned Bongo Bongo in our favorite boss battles episode. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, there's also a floating head and arm, floating head and hands in Wind Waker. I think there's one in Skyward Sword as well. So we have Mazal. Yes, Mazal has a little bit of a twist. Not, it's not just the shoot the thing on the palms. There's a twist. Why don't you tell our audience about it? I loved this. Little yeah. Tweet. So this one, I had that. Yeah, it integrated a lot of different elements. There was shrinking involved. There were the mole mitts involved. There was the bow and arrow involved. Mm-hmm. Like you had to use all of these different things to uh, defeat this boss. And I really, I like when they combine those things. It creates enough of an extra challenge without getting like ridiculously yeah. annoying and difficult. What's super cool about this character is that it's, yeah, it's like an ancient robot head arm thing, whatever. But um, usually when you encounter these kind of bosses, it's like, all right, shoot the glowing thing on the palm. The, Hit it when the it's character's going to be stunned, then get it on the face. That's yep. the general theme. So the twist here in Minish Cap is, okay, fine, we shoot the palms to do the thing. But while the head, you could say, is stunned, you actually learn that you need to shrink down, mm-hmm. go up into its mouth, yep. go up into its little robot brain, and start find, digging around. Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Keep Yeah, let, tell us, please. Dig, yeah, dig. you have to dig around and find the pillar that will be the one that will affect the boss. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you have to get big again. So there was that timing element too, and that you had to shrink and do this and get large again in the time before it wakes back was up or unstunned. whatever. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I thought this one was fun. I mean, at, the, at first when I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. It's hand guy. I'm always a fan of the hand guy bosses. This was a cool And then one. it was just a cool combination of things to do. Yeah, so... Even though I did not like the dungeon itself, I liked the boss a lot. The boss was great. Yeah. Well, then that brings us to the Temple of Droplets. Oh, that is also, I think the winds is the one where we learn, oh, shoot, the people took off with the um, the whatever the third thing you need. So that was, a, I think that's the dungeon where you actually don't get anything. 
technically. So then Ezlo tells you, well, we got to go to another dungeon because we're going to go, dang it all, we're going to go get that thing from these people. <laughs> Darn it. You know? And so we head towards the Temple of Droplets, which I can't decide yes. if this is a water temple or an ice temple. It's a little bit of both. Both, yeah. Cool board. little design on this one. A lot of looping paths, a lot of coming back to a hub room, mm-hmm. stuff um, like that. I wrote, pretty fun. Liked the ice challenge of of everything. Um, the lantern. I always, I don't know. The, <laughs> I feel like it's stupid for me to like the lantern so much because it oh, do tends to not do very much, but I just like... Well, a lot of times the flame lantern, well, this here is called the flame lantern, but a lot of times yes. the lantern literally lights up a room yeah, um, or activates torches. Here, the flame lantern helps you melt ice, mm-hmm. which is great. A little elemental thing. So, yeah, a little extra um, strategy there that you can do. Um, and then you use it to uh, light switches and stuff so mm-hmm. you can open doors and get treasure chests that way. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And the sunbeams. That was a cool element, too, I thought. To melt uh, some of the ice as well, I yeah. believe, right? I like, I like, I think I like ice themed dungeons and rooms and temples more than water ones. I don't know why. Yeah, as much yeah. as I don't like when, you know, you run onto fire and then you run around all crazy or you run on ice and you slip around. Mm. I'm never a huge fan of that. Like whenever I come upon an ice level in some other video game, I'm like, oh, here comes gosh. the ice physics. Yeah. Here <laughs> I'm going to be sliding all around and falling into mm-hmm. the abyss constantly. Right. Um, but it didn't bother me with this dungeon. Like. I remember enjoying this one. It's a little overwhelming at first. You get into that hub room, you see a frozen, massive Deku scrub, apparently, or something like that. I think it was actually called, oh, Octorox. I'm sorry. I was calling him Deku. But yeah, (laughs) you see a massive Octorok. Or actually, it's not massive. It's normal size. You've shrunken down. My mistake. Mm -hmm, Because you mm -hmm. do, this is just a teeny little like crack in the frozen lake when you get into it. Isn't that right? Yep. So it's another small dungeon. But um, um, it's a little overwhelming in the beginning. I think this is also one of those dungeons where you kind of see the end early and then you have to loop back around a lot. Yes. Yeah. And that has come up in other games as well where Mm -hmm. there's some big thing that you have to activate or set free or do something like that. And sometimes there's these moments where you're like, well, dang, there's the boss door. I'm ready to go. I got the, oh, doesn't this one give you the boss key very early? Yeah. I was like, I guess I'm set. Is this a Wind Waker moment where I'm just done already? Of course not. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no, they you hang on to that mistake. key. You you uh, basically get the 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 boss key, but then you can't get through because the Octorok, I think, isn't is still frozen. So yes. in a non key mechanic, you have to do some other puzzly things yeah. to get that guy out of the way. That's a cool little different. How thing. How did you feel about the boss battle? So this definitely an action packed boss battle. This is one where he's, he's spitting the stuff. You you got to do a little bit of the baseball, the tennis game, back and forth, shooting. You know, oh hitting yeah, the things back. I remember this guy. Okay, so this one, I think I had to do this one a couple different times because I died once or twice, just because I think the damage is more significant that you take. From I this actually one. had to do this boss a few times as well. This yeah. is a tricky one, but not tricky in like a this is super frustrating and unfair way. Mm-hmm. I liked the different phases. Of it. Um, I don't know. I, I do always like the element of shooting the things back at the boss, which mm-hmm. is another thing that comes up a lot in Zelda, um, usually in terms of magic. But this one was like the literally rocks. just a nut. Yeah, that he shoots. Oh, yeah, the rocks that he shoots out. So the first phase is that, if I remember correctly, then you do use your items a little bit. You use your flame on him. Oh, you light his little tail on fire. Isn't that right? The oh, flower. He's, I know a, he's you kind use of the a flower. Lantern, yeah, and I think it gets dark at one point. It starts to freeze or then you set its tail on fire. The the stuff goes up the body and then you can do your sword thing. It always ends with a sword thing. Yeah. Um, And then you can use your bow and arrow or boomerang. There's like a few different ways that you can beat this mm-hmm. one, which is cool. I like when oh, yes, when you can use yours. different items and see which one works best for I you. I enjoy that very much as well. It's getting closer and closer to Breath of the Wild just a little bit there with that. Yeah. Not that that's what needs to happen, but that's what's happening just a little bit, even though they certainly weren't aware of that at the time of making this boss. But this boss is also humongous. It takes up easily a third of the screen. I mean, it's the screen's panning around, but for the most part, yeah. it's a big one. <clears throat> yeah, so it was a little hard to get away from it. I think that's where I ran into the most trouble was mm-hmm. just like, running as fast as I possibly could away from this thing. But because yeah. the it's so big and the room is so small, I was like, I'm having trouble here. So I think that's why I just ended up getting hit a lot and taking a lot of damage. I had to do that one a couple of times. That's fine. It was fun. That's fine. So then we uh, basically have our, 
I don't think we have all four of our four swords yet, if I remember correctly. You do have your three now. You have your th- you get your third element in this fourth dungeon. So you go back to Hyrule. Each time, each time you're going back to Hyrule Castle to activate your power up your four sword a little bit more, and you can make another link and make another link. And at this point, you're up to being able to duplicate yourself twice, mm-hmm. which leads us to the Palace of the Winds. Yeah, I got really confused. Like, <laughs> don't name. Two different things of, of winds. winds. Of the winds. <laughs> Get confused. Palace of the Winds was an emotional challenge for me and a little bit of a logistical challenge. I was less inspired by this temple. How did you? Uh, how did you feel about it? Uh, this is the one where it got super difficult and it started not getting fun anymore. This is where you get Rock's Cape, which allows you to double jump, which is a play on Rock's Feather. That's mm-hmm. kind of cool. Mm-hmm. That's the big item you get. Yep. Very vertical. A lot of the dungeons in this game have vertical elements, even though you're still seeing just horizontal uh, things. There's a lot of going up and down, falling through holes in many of these, but that's certainly completely now true. This is almost a three-dimensional dungeon. Yes. Uh, you're flying around, you're flying up, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that part I liked. The part that I had so much trouble with was that they're just the enemies wouldn't give up hearts, the pots wouldn't give up very much many hearts. I don't tend to look around for heart pieces, so I think I was at a big disadvantage there because I didn't mm. have the amount of life that like the walkthrough person would have had, or you know, perhaps Hyrule Field would have given you a couple more actual yeah. hearts. I yeah, see, if I, I was see. actually like following the kinstone pieces, maybe I don't know. Yeah, I think get you do get pieces. some hearts from some of the kinstones. Yeah. So I just found it was really hard to regenerate life, and also in this game, when you die, you do not come back with full life. You come back with three, I think. Something like that. It's tricky. Not enough. So I kept getting just stuck um, because you know the save points only happen so many places, mm-hmm. um, the checkpoints or whatever. So yeah, whenever I found a place where you could go in and out of a room 50,000 times and there were pots that had hearts in them, <laughs> that's do what that? I do. Oh yeah. Oh, Cause funny. I'm like, okay, I need to break these pots that yep. conveniently magically regenerate. Um, every time I re-enter this room Speaking and get of pots, my life yes. back up. Pardon me. Pardon me. Speaking of pots, there are a couple pot push puzzles in this thing. Mm-hmm. That was kind of fun. I like those. This those- is a very linear dungeon though yeah. if i remember correctly there's a lot of just just you're just jumping from thing to thing it's very action based mm-hmm. there's kind of even the mario brothers great thing yeah where you're climbing on the grates yeah not necessarily climbing on them vertically but jumping right. through the little trap doors or yeah. the, f- the graphics are almost identical to yeah. what you'd see oh it reminded me of that for sure yeah absolutely um, so I would have had a better time with it if I had had more hearts, I think, and could last a longer. Because yeah. this one was a long dungeon, too, yes, right? Yes, it was. Long, long and long. Long and linear. It's- yeah. So I, I remember playing this one. I'm like, how much more is there of this one? Honestly, I felt exactly the same way. We're up in the sky for this one. You t- you meet kind of some of these new people, these new characters that are minish based they're mm-hmm. from the sky the sky people you go you're going up and up and up you finally find the uh actual like city or temple which then brings you up even higher which brings you to this palace of yeah. the winds before you know it you're presumably hundreds of miles if not a hundred miles up above hyrule and it's kind of cool that the graphics reflect that though there's definitely some parallax scrolling below you where you can see oh, the yeah. clouds and the land below mm-hmm. so you definitely feel high dare i say i actually did get a touch of vertigo like you know that little bit of that feeling in your stomach when you're up a little too high in a video game mm. or in real life so it was some, effective sometimes with those jumps i was feeling that a little bit yes absolutely uh the, yes the the dungeon takes some uh some restraint of frustration but when you when you get to the end there is a in my opinion super fun boss yes which we um, spoke about yeah i remember you talking about this one so i was definitely looking forward to it in the game i was like i know this one is coming up because <laughs> i haven't seen it yet and i know uh, i'm getting toward the end here so this is gyrog pear uh-huh and um gyrog must be kind of the name of these two flying mantises that happen and so you've heard about this boss through our favorite boss bass bosses favorite boss battles episode Mm -hmm. Um, when it started, what were your feelings? So I knew kind of what to expect Mm. because you talked about it before Um, and how like the level of difficulty for the dungeon itself. I was actually surprised at how not super difficult the boss was. It was challenging. It was fun, but it wasn't super frustrating. And I think I did have to do it a couple times, but oh, I lied. I wrote one try. (laughs) It requires many mini phases. Yes. You know, it's like, here's a little phase of this, a little phase of that. 
yeah. jump onto this guy, jump onto that, that guy. There's definitely verticality. Again, with this whole dungeon being almost a 3D dungeon, you have to, it doesn't, the graphics don't fully express this, but you have to jump up on one of the yeah. mantises. It flies around, you jump back down. And that threw me off a little bit. But then, yeah, yeah, so then you have to duplicate yourself in the pattern of the eyeballs, which is a cool thing. So you have to match that. So it's not just duplicating yourself. You have to do it in a certain way. And yes. then you have to do it also after, I think, the first time you hit it you have to do it while also avoiding the projectiles mm -hmm. that are coming at you so there are lots of elements to it but yeah i thought it was awesome there's an there's an action-packed element Unique to boss. it the fact that this all of the even though where you're standing doesn't move too much the clouds and the background they're whipping around you can imagine a camera this yeah. is about as epic as it gets on yes. a 2d zelda game yeah you know, this is this is about as action packed as it gets. I loved that you had to change. So we are speaking to this. If, if people aren't familiar, you're speaking to, again, this kind of idea where Link can duplicate himself mm -hmm. into three other links at this point. I think you have your whole f four swords put together. I think you have all four for this one. Or is it only three? It might only be three. Three. Yeah, well, even so, maybe it is only three. But anyway, um, there's little tiles on the ground that if you charge your sword up on them, you can duplicate yourself on other tiles. Mm -hmm. So normally in the Minish Cap, you'll see three switches somewhere or two switches. Let's just say three switches. Mm -hmm. And you might have to find tiles somewhere else on a different part of the screen or a different screen entirely to duplicate yourself in the appropriate pattern so that as you navigate back up to these switches, all three of your links are in the appropriate position so that if they do a sword attack, you can activate all three switches at the same time which for the construct of the game, that's what is what is important and how it works. So that's cool, but that stuff doesn't change. In this action-packed boss battle, you have to do that pattern thing, but with these eyeballs that are opening and closing. Mm -hmm. So you never know what the pattern's going to be, and you right. have to make that choice very quickly. Once you yeah. see the eyes opening, you have to start charging up and making those patterns yeah, fast. Yeah, because stuff is flying at you, and the blue uh, manta's going to come and try to throw you off too, and mm -hmm. I liked it. It's fun. We are running out of time here. We've been talking for a long time, so we're going to have to start moving a little quicker if you don't mind. Yeah. Part of that is largely on me here. I'm maybe taking a little too much time going through each of these dungeons. Gosh, Dave, shut up. But we basically have one left. I actually miscounted earlier with, with six dungeons. I accidentally included the Royal Crypt in my notes here. But um, mm. really, so now we've had our five main dungeons. They took four elements. They stretched it out to five dungeons. And we have our final dungeon, which is Dark Hyrule Castle. Yes. So you go back to Hyrule. Vadi shows back up. He sucks you into another universe, makes Hyrule nasty. And uh, you do that. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, I remember this one being kind of difficult, but I don't, I didn't feel like the grandeur, I guess, that you normally do when you're in Hyrule Castle toward the end of a Zelda game and it's all spooky and evil and whatnot. I agree. So it was just kind of like, okay, I just have to run along the halls and do a couple puzzles yeah. here and there. It didn't seem too complicated. It was or... so crazy. It was like, it felt like the final dungeon. It, I mean, it didn't feel like, but it kind of felt like half of one. It didn't, uh, we were just walking around. It felt like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, luckily there is a room in this one where you could get fairies and hearts. So I didn't have like the same mm -hmm. difficulty as in the palace of winds that I, um, that I did there. So I was able to regenerate my life a little easier because yeah. I was still a little disadvantaged there. I didn't have too many hearts to work with, but, um, oh yeah, I think you have to fight a lot of the dark nuts in, in dark Hyrule yes. castle. Right. Yeah, and those are honestly, I think those are like maybe my favorite Zelda enemy. These kind because, of big knights. Yeah. Cause they're always challenging. I always like in the other Zelda games where their armor is kind of falling off and mm -hmm. there's that element to it. I like the sound effects involved and they're kind of more intimidating than the other enemies. So yeah. I like fighting those. I think they're challenging and fun. Uh, speaking to the music a little bit, there's a, this is kind of like a remix on the Hyrule castle theme from a link to the past, which is cool. Oh, that was it. It was a little bit more spooky. Spooky. Mm -hmm. um, but, ooh, the ball and chain oh, guys. Yes. I got massacred by those. Oh, I had a hard time with the ball and chain guy in Oracle of Seasons the other week. Ugh. Um, so I had a I had a tough time. I think the way that I ended up beating them was fl like floating over them a thousand times and kind of like teasing them like, okay, come and get me. I and see. then floating over them and using rocks them cape, doing double yep. jump over them. Yep. Yeah. I could see that. I would use that too. I think. And then we have Vadi. You fight Vadi and I don't remember it being particularly amazing. One, one try. Yeah. One try. That I think like I gotta, never happens. With like it. I'm almost having a hard time remembering it a little bit. Yeah. It just wasn't that challenging. I don't know. Vadi happens. Uh, 
you know, and then the land returns. We are really, really light, light on time, so we have to kind of wrap it up here, I think. All right. Uh, where, well, cause well we, the final boss battle wasn't that amazing, so I know, but not were, much to talk about. But overall, um, this game was a pleasure and fun. I remember liking it more the second time I played it than the first time. And um, for me, it was the graphic style was pretty cool. I actually love the super grid based graphics of A Link to the Past and the Oracle series. Mm -hmm. Oracle is kind of the perfect mix of both for me personally, as just as my taste. There are parts of Minish Cap that are almost a little too cartoony, but I still feel like you can see that grid tile based structure that's going on in Minish Cap. Um, I loved the the some of the new mechanics i actually ultimately enjoyed that they tried to ha include a lot of verticality in the game and especially in the dungeons make it feel more like a 3d game yeah in the mechanics not necessarily the visual execution right because they can only do so much there but exactly times yeah. where you're flying over canyons or flying over pits was kind of cool mm -hmm. so any final thoughts for you and then we'll get, get out of here Overall, um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was really fun to play. I didn't feel at any point like I'm, oh, I'm never going to be able to finish this or I'm never going to be able to beat mm -hmm. this game. Um, it wasn't as difficult as I, a time that I had, as I had with Link's Awakening. Mm -hmm. um, just the, the only gripes I really had were not seeing a point in the kinstones or the figurines. A couple of those things were useless to me at the time but again like you were saying maybe I would understand them and like them more the second time around I felt that they actually um, got in the way the first time I played I was like yeah. get these out of here agreed interesting um, so yeah just a few minor complaints but if I had to give it like a letter grade I had like a B plus yeah I think that's fair I think that's cool. Um, yeah, we don't normally do letter grades, but that's a cool sentiment. Absolutely. Yeah, if I had to. I would imagine for you playing it up on the screen, it almost feels like you're playing a Super Nintendo game or something. Yeah. Yeah. I I liked it. The, mm -hmm. I like colorful. I like cartoony. Not necessarily for all Zelda games, mm -hmm. to be sure, but I thought it worked really well with this one and the story, the elements. I thought that the art style of it made sense. Yeah. I liked it. Super cool. Let's yeah, get out of here. Uh, Kate, if people want to tweet us their thoughts about this game or if, any, if there's anything that we kind of skimmed over, which I don't know because we actually kind of took our time on this one. But I was just so excited to talk about it. I, maybe I moved a little too slow, but it was nice to really dig into these dungeons with For you. For sure. Um, in the game in general, actually. People can tweet us at Another Zelda Pod. They can find us on Instagram at Another Zelda Podcast. They can find our show at 65.media slash Another Zelda Podcast, which is where all of our shows are now, or all of our episodes are now uh, represented. And uh, let's see here. What else? What else? People, If people want to get in touch with you personally, Kate, where can they find you? Yeah, um, I, I probably will sign up for Twitter one of these days. I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> As it stands right now, I'm on Instagram, and uh, my name there is I Only Take Cat Pics. So you can check out my pictures, and you can send me a message on there if you'd like. Marvelous, marvelous! I am on Twitter and Instagram and Discord as Raptor Paint. And if you'd like to get it, it, in, involved in our Discord chats, uh, we have a link in the show notes, and we also have a link on our actual website. I'll be there shortly. And uh, <laughs> um, oh my. Uh, my, my messages are going off here. Um, let's see here. That's it. Yeah, Kate, let's do it. I'll see you in two weeks. What are we talking about? I know what we're talking about, but what are we talking about? We are going to talk about f -f -f fashion. <laughs> Whoa, that should be the title. <laughs> f dash, f dash, f dash, ashen. I'm not going to lie. I stole that from another podcast. So oh. uh, we, we should give them credit if we if we do that. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, outfits and armor and mm -hmm. things of the like. So. And I think it might be, I suspect, I, don't, I haven't seen your show notes yet. Let me know if I'm right or wrong. I think it might be a little bit through the lens of of outfits and armor that are included in Breath of the Wild. Yeah, that's kind of where I started just because there's so many things that you can mm -hmm. get in that game and, and wear and customize. So that's mm -hmm. kind of... A lot of throwback easy. outfits, a lot yes. of DLC outfits, other yep. things. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool indeed. Kate, I'll see you then. Okay, bye. Bye.